And welcome back to Podcasters Row, another year into the program. We're just getting ourselves into, what, a little, a little over 15 episodes we've already done so far, but we would love to go and be able to do more. I'd love to be able to do more of these episodes, and if you are interested, please go ahead and reach out to me on the website, kingofpodcasts.com. Again, kingofpodcasts.com, or find me on the same name under all social media channels, so that's including X, Facebook, Instagram, Threads, LinkedIn, and what have you. So, to start off 2024, I'm I have the pleasure to go and speak with a certified international fertility expert and founder and CEO of the Fertility Coach Academy, who helps people of all backgrounds on their path to conception to have healthy pregnancy, healthy baby, and carry the term. And with that, she also is hosting a program called Creation Innovation. And she's also a contributing author to three best-selling books, which include Naturally Conceived, The Creative Life Book, and Radical Self-Love. Has been featured in so much media, and we are grateful to have her on the program. I want to welcome Elizabeth King. Elizabeth, thanks for being on. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being on with us. What an interesting subject, because, well, I mean, for me, I'm, you know, I'm single, no kids, never married, but I am fascinated with all those that are able to go ahead and you know, however choices are made to be able to make that possible, whether it's through marriage or surrogacy or just however means it is, but for new life to be brought into this world. And I'm always concerned about the children that are being brought in. First of all, because of just how, you know, how, how not so often we're seeing two parent households be able to go and raise a child and bring them to an adult to be responsible, accountable, and really be bring something to society, be somebody that can benefit society, can benefit other people. It's very hard to see that. And so the thing is, your focus is on the initial conception. And for those that are, you know, women that get pregnant and finally get to conception, it's the process of just to that. Absolutely. I think, you know, thank you, first of all, for bringing light and awareness to this situation and subject, because I think, especially when you are single and not that's not your world, it seems so far removed, right? And that's kind of how it was for me, too. I didn't have my first child till I was 41. So I wasn't, it wasn't really on my radar. It wasn't something that I was always burning yearning to do to have a child. And so it wasn't really until I was in it that did I recognize the emotional strain that had come along with the process of wanting a child, struggling to have a child. I didn't realize at the time that globally the numbers are one in six people struggle with fertility or infertility, if you will. Um, that's, that's pretty crazy. I always say when you're in the Starbucks line, look at one in six of those people is currently struggling, whether it's male or female. And one in four is struggling at and or has had a miscarriage. So again, when I had my first miscarriage, I didn't know anybody who had one. I didn't realize those were the statistics. I'm a very black and white data-driven person. So to find out this information and to back that up with data from places like Harvard and the Mayo Clinic and et cetera, that have done studies to show that if you are going through this, it's the same stress level as someone who's going through cancer, which really validates the people that are going through it and don't recognize like, oh my gosh, this is so stressful. Well, yeah, they actually have done studies to (laughs) say how stressful it is. So again, thank you for just bringing awareness to that because I think part of that education around it is the awareness because we are not taught in school in America anything about your fertility or anything of the sort. So it's really great to now be having these conversations openly and honestly. And then to second your point about then stewarding these new people into the world and hoping that they can contribute to society in in a functional, better way, I think, than not that we were in our generation, perhaps, but we just have more awareness than perhaps our our the people that went before us. And I think that's all we can do is when we know better, we can do better. And the more that we learn and educate ourselves around how to parent 
children, the better off we are rather than just saying like, oh, well, there's no manual for this. Yeah, there's no manual, but there's a lot of smart people that have written a lot of things in order to help you do parenting. So um, but, 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 you know, obviously always- parenting has gotten much more difficult now only because of just what is in front of your child as sure. they grow up. But now, 100%. The, uh, one thing I think is fascinating in your story, you spoke with Shout Out LA a while back, and you expo- uh, you were asked about you know coming up with the idea of the business, but it's your personal story. The first of all, that at age thirty you were divorced, you decided to freeze your eggs, came mm-hmm. back later. At, if I was, you were still single, thirty six years old, you were still single. You came back, you went and tried in vitro fertilization to try to freeze the eggs as an insurance policy, not knowing if you would meet Mister Wright anytime soon. Diagnosed with fibroids at thirty nine, and You met your husband, and then, again, at 41 years old, let's go ahead and I have, you know, I've done this process. I prepared for it, and now let's go and have a child. And you went ahead, and you got pregnant after healing from the surgery. Healthy baby, but then you had a miscarriage, and this is where you had your life coaching you had done for 10 years turned into fertility coaching. So with that, right into the play... A lot of women right now could be listening to this program and saying to themselves, they're the ones that are very career minded because Mm -hmm. the traditional sense that might have been, you know, 50, 100 years ago, oh, you know, women should want to become and strive to become, you know, wives, homemakers, mothers. That is completely not, that is not the thought process anymore. Make your career and then think about, you know, if you want to think about children. It's like, I mean, do you see, is it from a woman's point of view, do you see that that's happening more often that women are being pushed off to go ahead and do that? So like where the idea of seeing what you did, Elizabeth, be able to go ahead and conceive at 41 years old and then do and have three children after that. Women will say, well, this is why I should go ahead and wait because she did it. No, I'm not certainly, I'm certainly not saying Everybody wait till they're 40 years old. We know that the, you know, we do have our AIDS, eggs do age. That mm-hmm. is a fact. But I'm also here to say, if I can do it and do all the things to prep my body in order to make sure that I did actually have three children naturally over 40, it is possible, more possible than we think. And I have helped thousands of women also do this. And just because I had a miscarriage at 42 doesn't mean that I don't counsel thousands of people at in their 20s and 30s that also have a miscarriage. So I want to kind of demystify that as well. So it do, right. it's not just because you're in your 30s or just because you're in your 40s that your eggs are bad. No, that that is not that's not it. So now if I were to say to people go ahead and do your career and we we can bank on the fact that that's going to happen later you know, it's a gamble. It really is a gamble. But can we do all the things to prepare our body to make sure that our risk versus reward being a healthy baby is, you know, more so on the reward side? A hundred percent. Years ago, we didn't even know that we had the, the ability to affect change to our eggs. We just felt like, well, I was told you're 40 years old, you have 40 year old eggs. Well, you can look at somebody who's 40 years old and, or I always use, um, Oh, Jane Fonda, Jane Fonda, as an example, she has always looked amazing for her age, right? right? So you can see an 80 year old that looks like Jane Fonda and an 80 year old who looks like she's 120 years old, right? So we can see how the body is different for everybody on the outside. And that's the same on the inside. So if we're doing things to help our bodies, and this is for men and women, because sperm actually does age as well. Although many celebrity men lead us to believe that that's not really true. But after 40, your sperm does change. So you should and want to be doing the same types of things that women are doing also in order to make sure that your your body is where it needs to be in order to have a healthy embryo and a healthy baby. Now, back to your question, I'm sorry about sure. leading your career and all of those things. Yes, I think it's possible to do all all of it. I still hear stories where there's families where they have a son and a daughter and they're like, okay, we'll put more money towards the education for the the son and hopes that the woman finds a man to marry her and Mm -hmm. maybe doesn't have to support herself. Well, I've owned my own business now for 25 years and my own coaching business since 2008, however long that's been. So I've, 
I have always been that person that's doing that sort of thing. And the children and freezing the eggs and all of that was more of, okay, I have my 401k and I have my insurance policy for this situation. It wasn't that I always thought that I had to, you know, be a mom. I think I had this knowing that I would, but therefore I wasn't, I wasn't concerned about it. It was like, check the box, check the box, move on. Hopefully I'll meet a guy at some point that I can build this family with. And if not, there the eggs are there, and we'll see what happens. Um, but now the other thing I too do, is that I mean, I want to give women more credit the fact that a lot more ability to be able to go and manage. I don't think a man could go and handle the fact of his career plus children in the same way, not even close. You would be, you're correct, I think. But also, there's this whole new <clears throat> resurgence as well right now. I just have one of my clients had her baby. Um, in December, which was a month and a half ago, on her own. She is working her career. She's high up at one of the Fortune 500 companies. And she decided, I'm not going to wait for a guy anymore. I'm going to I'm going to do this by myself. So they re women really are seeing what the possibilities and options are for themselves if that is something that they want to do. I have no judgment either way for anybody. I'm just amazed every day that we live in a world that we have all these options in regards to fertility. It's really amazing. And we are so fortunate to be able to have options <clears throat> for lots of different ways to parenthood. So if you have something that's structural going on or you have some diagnosis that perhaps makes you think that you may not be able to have a child or your own child biologically, there are so many avenues that you can go to get that. And I think that's part of where coaching helps people to navigate that process to say, what does that look like? Where do I go next? How do I digest this information that someone just told me I need to have an egg donor or whatever it may be? You never think in your whole life that you're going to be told you need to have a sperm donor or an egg donor. That's just not something that crosses your mind as a child. So it's these conversations now that we're helping people to digest and process and navigate and help them get to their babies. I'm amazed by the, the catalog of people you've already had on the program. One of those really uh, stood out to me was obviously the, the former Olympic figure skating champion, Tara Lipinski. And what she went through in terms of going through IVF, to go ahead and help to bring a child for her life. And with everybody that you talk to, obviously a lot of medical professionals, a lot of people that give their own personal accounts, their own stories from either as a, the husband supporting to the wife or the one that's trying to support that mother to be. But one of the other areas that comes to mind for me and as a fertility coach and for the fertility coaches that you speak with, I must imagine that you must go through that issue where when there are women that are going through the process and going to bring a child to term, there are some that are struggling with the fact that they don't see themselves making it to term with that child or choosing to not hold on to the baby either through adoption or by an unfortunate thought they might not want to have it at all. And I can imagine those kind of issues might come across. So, I mean, when you have that as a fertility coach, as an expert, I mean, how often do you ever come across that issue to try to be able to continue to encourage that mother to follow through and for the, and why it's so important? So most people that come to me are trying to conceive and trying to desperately have a baby. They've gone through multiple rounds of IVF. They have had multiple losses. Um, like Tara Lipinski, who shares her story that they ended up having to have a surrogate and many celebrities that are, are now really open about their stories, which is great because, again, we're building this awareness and education, right. is that they are they get to this point where that is all they can think about. Their mind is completely consumed about how they can become a parent. And so that's really where we're stepping in. Now, if we were talking to somebody who got pregnant in a situation, you know, maybe some tragedy happened or some trauma happened and they found themselves pregnant and didn't know what to do from there. That's a different situation. Mm -hmm. I can certainly help with that, but I have not personally carried somebody through that process of how do we give that baby up for adoption or something of that nature. Now, th those big decisions and have also been affected by laws in our country in the United yeah. States as of recent. And so that makes things a little bit more complicated with each state having different laws and 
things like that. And again, back to education, a lot of people are uneducated about what those laws actually mean. And um, for example, the word <laughs> abortion you can have that on your medical records, but really that what they mean from a medical perspective and what was on the insurance is just essentially meaning they are taking this baby or tissue or however somebody wants to uh, talk about it out of the body. It doesn't necessarily mean there's somebody who's gone pregnant, you know, 18 times and 18 times wanted to get rid of that baby. And so that's what it is. There's two different, very different things happening here. And unfortunately, most people that speak about it, take it under this umbrella of the woman who is, you know, blatantly making this decision to not go forward with a child. So I would just recommend to anybody who's talking about those situations to do a little bit more digging about what their state is actually talking about and figuring out where they where they fall on that. Because when they say that, unfortunately, it's like a blanket statement of what we all assume. But unfortunately, right. that's not necessarily the case. And I appreciate that because, as you said, really there's a certain – type of a, a woman that's going to come to you because again desperate or absolutely wants to have a child now that's some of the ones that they, that have the issue where i'll tell you this i know someone that you know uh, that i've worked with i'll just say that that did freeze her eggs did go through round after round of in vitro and mm-hmm. well you know near her 50s trying to conceive and not to no avail i mean she has you know because of who she's with you know they have he has children from a previous marriage so there's that to couldn't go with but again coping with the fact of not being able to go ahead and go through all all that work and all the attempts and then also the same cases for those that that have miscarriages which you know i never hear a lot about because i mean those for a lot of women, I would imagine it's very hard to go ahead and bring that up. And for some that have had multiple miscarriages to go through yes. and then go again to try to go ahead and conceive and keep fighting, you know, mm-hmm. the mental mindset for those that come into wanting to be mothers and knowing what their track record has been, having conception and not being able to go and have that possible. And for those that might not be able to have children, you were talking about what you had to do in terms of, there's been birth bereavement. There's also been the area that you talk about when it comes to really just counseling and just giving guidance. I can only imagine that, you know, what you had to go through in that respect with who you've yeah, talked it, to. It's, I personally believe that it's so helpful when you're going through something and you're trying to get help through that process that that person understands what you've been through. That's always something that has been important for me to feel that alignment. If I was seeing a therapist around, I tell this story often, after my first miscarriage, I went to somebody who specialized in in miscarriage loss. I walked out of there. I didn't know if she had ever had a miscarriage. I didn't know if she had any children. I didn't know anything about her. And I felt worse about my situation because I was just looking for hope. I wanted somebody to say, you're going to be okay. This is really normal. It's not your fault. We'll help you get pregnant again. I, ha- I That's happened to me. And I have one child, two children, three children, whatever. And I didn't find that. And I think that there's a fine line when you're helping somebody. We call it, you don't want to get in the pool with them. But you also want to be there to support them through these parts of grief. They they have just experienced literally a death, not only a death, but that death happened inside of their body, which right. is another really strange thing to think about. So there's a lot of trauma that comes around that and sometimes even PTSD because there's very few other situations that you are in as a person where you have experienced a death and you have to go back to that scene of the crime, so to speak, over and over, which in our case is the doctor's office and that table that you have to lay down, get your stomach scanned and all of those same thoughts keep coming back again. Mm -hmm. So you don't, you're not for, if you have a car accident in an intersection, you're not really forced to go that way. You generally can go a different route another time or, you know, there's usually other situations where you can go that you can avoid those places of the Mm -hmm. same trauma. In a miscarriage loss, there really isn't a lot. So having somebody to help you through that mindset of what are the tools that are going to help you to not only feel that you 
every situation is different. And just because it happened the one time isn't going to happen again. I use the analogy a lot of times. You fell off the horse. That is not fun. And in order to get back on the horse, you're going to remember that you fell off before. But how do we do it in the next time and feel, okay, I'm going to do these things a little bit differently. I'm going to keep my mindset in a different place as much as I possibly can. And I'm going to hold somebody's hand through this because right. it's it's scary. And there is somebody to hold my hand through it, right? I remember talking to my husband about it once I started really digging into this myself. He's like, oh my gosh, I wish we had somebody like you when we were going through it. Right. Even from his perspective of the supporter of me, he didn't know what to say or what to do or how to make it better. And that's all he was looking for, you know, is... Right how do we how do we fix this and how do we make it better so it the dynamic of all of these things is really complicated in a sense oh, yeah. of there's a lot of different nuances that come up but at the same time it's so common and the fact that people don't really talk about it or verbalize it as much just me makes people feel like they're so alone when they're going through it when really right. you just want to find that one person or that group or somebody that you can be like oh they get me they know what this feels like and i'm going to be okay because they did it or she did it or he did it right. and we're going to get through this so i want to go and last one one more question with you and it's based on the fact of um i think with podcasts in general of course if you're just if you're the host talking to other experts and other people that give the, their own personal account in the same way i've learned about when it comes to therapy or people that have gone through trauma that they they will absorb they will interact they'll communicate better when they have someone that they're talking to that have also have their own personal account they've gone through their own personal similar issues you can relate a relatability to right. it how often do you share your relatability to the listeners on your podcast creation and innovation compared to the guests because i guess do you notice that your audience really resonates a lot if they get to hear more about your story as opposed to the ones you speak with? That's an interesting question because I we have no, noticed in the data and studies that we've done with our own audience that they want to know more about my story. Right. And I kind of think often that they know my story already, right? If that most of them have either been following me on Instagram or TikTok right. or somewhere along or the podcast, you know, so that's my mistake. I do need to do more about that. Although I do, if there's a introduction point where I see some crossover that I share my story, I certainly do. Right. There's nothing about it that is, you know, that I, I'm not open with people to sharing about that. I'm just usually so intrigued by whoever I'm talking to that I forget about my own situation and how that fits into everything. But I do think that that social evidence about my story and or people that I have worked with helps other people. Like you mentioned your friend in their 50s. I have a client right now who's 52 who is trying to have her first baby. It is possible. I, ha I have had patients, or clients yeah. that are in their early 50s that have had them. Now, it might not be. One is biologically both from the, the egg and the sperm of that couple. But I have some that are egg donor, some that are sperm donor, and some that are um, – embryo adoption, which is essentially they they adopt an embryo and then they and transfer or insert that embryo into themselves and carry that baby as their own, essentially. So there's a lot of different ways. And I think that's kind of when you're talking about your own fertility, again, wh whether it's male or female, is to really talk to somebody first, get get the data. What are my options, right? Because in our head, we think, oh, I can never do IVF because it's so expensive, or I could never do IVF because of all the needles or whatever. Talk to somebody who's done it and, you know, get the good, bad, the ugly, so you know what you're dealing with, and then make that decision rather than taking this program that you have in your mind from something you heard or you read many years ago, and you're taking that as gospel of what it is going to dictate your life, figure out what's happening now. There's a lot of grants that are out there for IVF. A lot of insurance companies now carry it, offer fertility coverage, which they didn't even two years ago, wasn't really as common as it is now. So there's a lot of really great options. And if anybody is ever curious listening to this podcast about my story and, and getting to know more of that and the social evidence, you can 
DM me. You can listen to anything that I've put out there and I, I share that. And part of that reason is because we, we do take in that pro programming from our subconscious mind of what we've heard from somebody else, right? So if you hear over and over, I had my last kid at 44, then you're going to be like, oh, okay. Wow. That's great. You know, that's that I can do that too. I had somebody recently ask me, but are they healthy? A hundred percent. My children are healthy. If you saw them, they're running around like little crazy Indians, you know, little, I have three little boys and they're very healthy. And I understand where that con that question comes from because when I was growing up, we were told like if you had a child over thirty five, you it was going to probably have Down syndrome. That was just what was around. That was what was programmed in our subconscious mind. Now, if we go against the grain a little bit that about that and start to seek out these people who have had healthy children over forty, then that social evidence starts to change our subconscious mind, right. and we realize it is possible. It's so common. We just have to seek that out. It's like when you, once you see the green car and you start looking for green cars, you see them everywhere. Right. Once you start seeing, looking for people having babies in their mid to late forties, you see them more and more out there. Exactly. The problem is people on social media generally talk about the negative rather than shout from the rooftops of my pregnancies were so easy. It, this was amazing. And you can do this too. That, that's not, we don't, for some reason, especially around fertility and pregnancy and all those things, People aren't talking so much about the good. It's unfortunately more focused on the bad, which just well, tends to, you yeah. know, feed into that. Well, then that's also just that that's just what social media can do. I mean, it creates this whole grandeur of, uh, that really creates a delusion for some people that don't realize, okay, this is not necessarily what happens to everyone. So you can't magnify to that point. You can't just apply it to yourself and think that's going to be the case. I agree Correct. with that. But that's right. another story for another day. Uh, so yeah. the website, uh, really to get everything to, about yourself and what you're doing, ElizabethKing.com. And also you can look for the podcast, Creation Innovation. Just look at the About section and pull down. You'll find podcasts. But also your shows on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all major platforms I see. 130 episodes is amazing. And you consistently every week. And, you know, one thing I will say, you know, I've done a lot of production on the side of podcasts, I've done, I want to say at least 25, 30,000 hours of podcasting and I've worked with a lot of wonderful people. It would be wonderful to be working with someone like you, obviously with your, with what you're doing and to be able to consistently have the passion to continue to put out this content so regularly. That's wonderful. And I think that's one thing that you're learning from the data. Like you said, by getting more of your story, I always like to go and say in terms of when I'm coaching and producing other shows, when you're that expert, go ahead and match the level of expertise you have with any guests you're with because you are just as important because people are not just coming just for the guests. They're coming for you. So you're always the reason the show is here first and foremost. And people come in because they want to hear your story and you know the right questions to ask as well on top of that. So Thank this you is for wonderful. that reminder. No, oh, absolutely. I no, but I, I, I got a chance to hear you're doing a wonderful job and it's wonderful that you're putting the show out, out there and, it's important, and it's a niche that doesn't get reached out that much enough that you would, I would imagine. I mean, you go, and people can go ahead and take time to go and read books or find audio books, maybe in certain subjects. And you know, I mean, you don't get a lot of opportunities to go and talk to the doctors so much. But like what you have right now with what you're doing, and other coaches like yourself, this is crucial. And bringing this together and bringing this community together is a wonderful idea. And I'm glad you've been able to go do so much and also use this as a platform. For for business and also just to build your own story. It's wonderful. So, Elizabeth, thank you. thank you so much for being on with me. I really do appreciate you taking time out and finding this little podcast to be on. I really do. Thank you. I really appreciate being here. So, my pleasure. So, that's where we're going to leave it right there. More podcasters row to come. I wish I was a little more consistent, but if you want to go ahead and give your chance to go and be heard on the program, just like Elizabeth has, please go ahead and reach out to me. Just find the website, kingofpodcasts.com. There's a contact form there. Again, kingofpodcasts.com. Thanks for listening in. We'll talk to you next time.